All right, welcome everyone to the South Brevard Garden Club Association March 1st meeting of 2021. My name is Joyce Barton, I'm the president. And uh, I'd like to welcome all of you here today. We have a good turnout so far, 20. Uh, we're looking forward to our speaker today, which uh, Tammy uh, will introduce in a moment. Before we get started, I think we have an inspirational reading from our Vice President, Judy Ying. All right. I have two garden tips for you. Two good ones. First one is if we plant our vegetables and herbs closer to our front door or side door or back door, easy access to water and uh, to see them all the time and they are more chance to survive and uh, from my 10 years experience and that is so true all my vegetables and uh, herbs plant on south side far side from my house all die but all the ones survive is near my back door and i see them all the time and i can water them and i eat them so that is really true from my experience. The second one is you played with rain. When the rain is, you go out to pour weeds, it's much easier than the dry soil. So that's a good one. I, I like to do that, but I didn't know why, but now I saw the, the, the tips on paper, it really makes sense. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Um, before we introduce our speaker, I'd la like to add another couple inspirational readings that I found that are kind of related to our topic today that we're, we're all excited to hear from. Um, and one is, it's not how busy you are, but why you are busy. The bee is praised and the mosquito gets swatted. Author unknown. And then I actually found another um, sweet, <laughs> no pun intended, little uh, saying, and it ended up coming from the Bible. So then that raised my curiosity and I looked to see how many times honey is mentioned in the Bible. And it's mentioned 61 times. So in Proverbs, there's actually two, um, at least two, one is Proverbs 24, 13, Eat honey, my child, for it is good. And the other one is Proverbs 16, 24. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. So with that, um, we would like to segue into our speaker. And Tammy, where'd you go? I need to get you to unmute. Can you unmute? I know I muted you just because I wasn't sure what was happening. So. I'm good to go? Yep. Okay. We'd like to welcome Kristen Swayze from LKC Honey, local to Melbourne Beach, extremely knowledgeable about honey and bees, and also has a really cool website that has a lot of um, gift box opportunities, makes an amazing, very unique gift, and I've known her a long time and just really look forward to hearing her ramble on. Kristen. Thank you, Tammy. It's so wonderful to see everybody. I love this, love to hate this platform of Zoom chatting, but you get to be in front of a lot of different people all at once, which is really cool. And I really am thankful for you guys for having me. Are you guys ready for me to start screen sharing and go through? Okay. Yeah, and if I can just suggest before you get started, um, Kristen, is if you if you can put um, speaker view on your devices, everyone, then you'll get to see the full picture of what Kristen is going to share with us. Sure. Okay. View. Uh, can you guys see it? Yeah. Yay. <laughs> I was practicing with my sister last night. This is a new platform for me to be presenting through. 
So I was like, Cheryl, we need to do a Zoom call and I need to make sure this works because I do not want to disappoint tomorrow. <laughs> so, all right. So I'm going to talk about some pollinators today with the idea of gardening behind it. But before we get into that, um, like Tammy said, I'm Kristen Swayze. I own LKC Honey, which LKC stands for the initials of all of our first names. Uh, my husband's Leo, I'm Kristen, and our kids, Kayla, Cora, and Leo, all sort of combined to make uh, the name of our company. Everybody always asks, like, what does that stand for? So there you go. So Leo, my husband, he is our sort of master beekeeper while I kind of steer the ship and the kid, keep the kids afloat. Um, for us, beekeeping became sort of an accidental journey. It started about four years ago when Leo said, I think I want to get some bees. And I kind of said, mm, maybe not. <laughs> we were back and forth uh, between building on some property that we owned down in Miko or moving beachside. Um, and we were expecting our third child. I politely asked if we could wait to get the bees until we figured out where we were going to live. And in typical Leo fashion, the next week he came home and said, we're now parents to two kids, two dogs, and about 20,000 bees. So I was a little like hesitant on it. Um, but when I started doing some research and learned that one out of every three bites of food that we eat is possible because of bees and other pollinators, and also got a taste on how good our honey was, I was pretty hooked and decided that it was something that I could get behind and start being involved. Um, so since then, we've grown from about three hives to two different apiaries, which is where we, uh, a place where a beekeeper keeps their hives, um, with around 50 hives and is always growing. One set of our, um, Colonies travel around Brevard County making our seasonal and single varietal honeys while our beachside hives are permanent residents of Melbourne Beach and create a completely different variety of honey, even though at some times they're only separated by about two miles via the Indian River Lagoon. So we're constantly expanding our apiaries and have recently started introducing backyard hive management, which one of uh, the members in the garden club is getting to test out and I hope she's enjoying it. Um, our boutique style honey is not mass produced, over processed or someone else's repackaged honey, which if you ever go to a farmer's market and you see someone there week after week selling the same honey, my guess is that it is honey that they're buying from somewhere else and repackaging it because unless you're running thousands of hives, you're going to run out eventually unless you're buying somebody else's that you're repackaging. So ask questions when you're out buying. We get excited when our customers learn for the first time that not all honey tastes like the standard honey bear from the grocery store shelves and that there can be so much more depth in the different varietals. We take really good pride in our beekeeping, harvesting, and packaging best practices. And we do our best to make this a this sustainable business, not only for the bees, but for the environment. Educating our customers and the public is one of our favorite parts of this accidental business. There's so much to learn about these amazing creatures and the products they produce. We could literally talk on it for hours, but I will spare you the hours and we'll keep it pretty short and to the point today. So today, to keep me on track and not lost in the world of pollen, propolis, and bee bread, here's a little bit about what we'll be talking about today. We're going to take a quick peek at to who our pollinators are and a closer look into the inner workings of a beehive and the honey they produce, and how to garden with bees and other pollinators in mind. And this picture is actually from the hives that we have out in Melbourne Beach, right behind the Old Town Hall Museum. Um, they are the happiest little creatures over there and love living beachside. So some pollinators um, are native to our area. Not all pollinators are bees and not all bees are honeybees. Florida is home to many native pollinators and surprise, surprise, the bee, the honeybee is not one of them. They were actually introduced to the US in the 1600s from Europe for honey production. And they kind of stuck because they're workhorses, they don't discriminate on different pollinating crops. 
Um, but our native bees, like this really cute halicid bee, this little metallic green bee is so cute. And we see them out in our garden all the time. Um, they're great pollinators, bumblebees, carpenter bees. They're the workhorses along with the honeybees. But some also sort of lesser known pollinators are our male mosquitoes, our moths, flies, wasps, birds, birds, excuse me. And sometimes even slugs will pollinate. Notice I kind of left out a big one, butterflies. Butterflies are promoted as these big giant pollinators, but really they are not a part of this sort of powerhouse group. Their legs are too thin. They don't have a body structure that will pick up the pollen as they visit the flowers. So they're really ineffective and they're just getting a free meal from the flowers without really giving anything back. So I learned that and I thought that was very interesting that these poor little butterflies that we're so excited about don't really do a whole lot. So now that we know who our pollinators are, let's talk about how pollinating actually happens. So for most flowering plants, they'll need the help of a pollinator. The flower will bloom in a way to show off their pollen bearing parts, the anthers, um, and it will dust the pollinators as they visit the flowers for the nectar. When they move along to the next flower, they bring some of that pollen with it and transfer it over to the next flower. This is a big one. I don't know if we're ready for it, but there are some plants that do not need the help of pollinators and are pollinated by the wind. These are our grasses, including corn and wheat, oaks, pines, elms, and ragweed. And if any of those are like going off in your head, like, oh, my allergies, my allergies, I, I know this. I've got some, this is gonna change your life and I'm sorry ahead of time. These guys are not producing nectar or showy flowers, so the pollinators are not interested. So if you're anything like me and love the beautiful oak trees, we've got one right out front of our house that I absolutely love, but I hate it this time of year because everything outside my house takes on that lovely neon greenish yellow tinge. Sadly, eating honey, even that our bees make, local or not, will not do you much good for your allergies, except give you a good sugar rush to help you forget about it because most of the plants that are responsible for seasonal allergies are part of this wind pollinating group that you will not find pollen in high enough concentrations to help your allergies. So that whole adage of a spoonful of honey to take your allergies away, it's really not going to do a whole lot for you, unfortunately. And I know it's a touchy subject seeing how as I sell honey, and the mainstream marketing has led us to all believe that honey is the magic cure. So still buy my honey, <laughs> it's local, <laughs> we make it. But for those allergies that are caused by the oats and the ragweed and everything else like that, it's really not gonna be a whole bunch of help. So honeybees, why are we using them? Why are we excited about them if they're not natives? Everything is about native and keeping it uh, as it was. So why are we okay with these non-native creatures? So there's, they've sort of taken on this cover girl status for pollinators and they do account for the majority of the consumable crop pollination. The reason being they're the true workhorses and they can be managed with just a little bit of help from the beekeepers. So the honeybees can travel around three miles to find flowers to pollinate and they visit around 5,000 flowers in a single day. So to put the magnitude of their work into perspective, I wanna talk about the almond growers. Um, that's a huge pollinator uh, crop. They are completely dependent on the bees to pollinate the crop. So every time you eat an almond, thank a bee because they were the ones that were responsible for making that happen. So the almond growers that are out in California, they depend on beekeepers from around the country. A lot of them come from Florida ship their bees to California just for this few short weeks for pollination. Beekeepers can make around $160 per hive they send out, which at the end of the season is around $240 million being paid out to beekeepers by the almond growers a year. So the bees are extremely important to those almonds that I just ate on my oatmeal this morning. 
All right, so now we're gonna take a little peek inside of our colonies. Um, in a single colony hive of bees, there can be between 20 to 50,000 bees and is made up mostly of female bees and queen. And one queen, in like 10% of the hives, there can be a double queen scenario, which is kind of entertaining. I have not ever seen one, but it is, uh, it can happen. So within the hive, the males, our drones, are really just there to mate with the queen, not the queen in their hive, but a separate one they find out in the drone congregation. It's like a singles bar for the bees. Um, and they eat the honey. They only make up about 10% of the colony's population. They do none of the work within the hive and they have no ability to sting and they will get kicked out of the hive once mating season is over because they do nothing to the benefit of the colony. If they're lucky enough to mate with the queen, unfortunately, they will die right after they're done mating. Womp womp, <laughs> poor guys. So our queens, our mighty, mighty queens, they can lay up to 3,000 eggs a day. So when you're looking at the numbers, it's 20 to 50,000 bees in a hive, she's laying 30,000 or 3,000 eggs a day. The turnover rate for these bees is fairly quick. And we'll talk about the lifespan of these workers in just a minute. So our queens in the wild hive will live about two to three years. Um, in a managed hive, we try to cycle them out once a year just to keep the quality of the hive um, where we would like it for honey production, also the temperament of the hive. Uh, and mite resistance. Mites are a uh, natural part of the bees that have sort of blown up in recent years. So to try and manage it, we do cycle our, our hive, our queens out. So really interesting, the misconception is that the queens are doing all the work. They're making all the calls about what's going on in the hive. But in reality, she is just responsible for making new generations of worker bees and drones while keeping the colony calm with her pheromones. She emits um, these pheromones that just let everybody know status quo is going on and there's no need to do anything else. So aside from deciding um, if she will lay either a fertilized egg, which will produce a worker, or an unfertilized egg, which will produce those drones. Everything else that happens within the hive is done by the worker bees. So these little gals only live for about five weeks. So that's why our queen is laying 3,000 eggs a day because the lifespan of our workers is so short. So she's constantly cycling in a new generation of workers. So, but during their short lives, they carry out all of the jobs within a hive. So when they first emerge from their cells, they're immediately nursed bees who care for the brood and the larva and the eggs. They clean out the wax cells after they've hatched out of them and they tend to our queen. They feed her a diet of um, all royal jelly and that's, what they do for the first few few days. As they get older, they'll start moving out. So within a hive, the very center in the bottom is where our queen will be laying most of her eggs. And then you get further out, they start storing pollen and honey um, and the nectar will come in those. So as they get older, they start leaving those middle brood frames and they move to the outer frames of the hive where they'll start producing wax. They'll control the temperature of the hives. Um, they'll store pollen. And most importantly, they turn the nectar that the foragers collect into honey. So a good way to think about bees at this age is our house bees. And we're going to cycle back to our house bees when we start talking about honey in a minute. So magically, once they turn 23 days old, woohoo! it's like turning 21 for us. Um, they finally get to leave the colony and become the protectors of the hives. So from other pests, wasps, other bee colonies that sense that they've got a good honey store, they'll come and check them out. So they'll shave them up, go somewhere else. They're also undertakers. So any bees that have 
reach the end of their lifespan. They kind of help clean the hive out. And then they become the ever important foragers where they will work until their wings literally give out. If you ever see a dead bee on the ground, take a look at its wings. Most of the time you'll see that the wings look kind of ragged and tattered. And it's because they will fly until they, their wings just give out. And research has shown us that foragers typically clock around 500 miles of flight time before they die. So they're, they are working hard and traveling a great distance. So now we know what sort of the different jobs are within the hives. Let's talk about honey because that's really the really exciting part. Um, like I mentioned before, honey from the very beginning is not a one size fit all. It's so much more complex than what meets the eye. To, to make the honey, a forager visits the flowers while simultaneously pollinating to collect our nectar. On each flight, so leaves a hive, will come back a couple times during the day. So on one of these flights, she will visit. <laughs> my kids are homeschooling and they're saying it's snack time. <laughs> Can I have my snack? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so on each of the, the forager's flights, she'll visit between 50 and 100 different flowers on a single flight, taking multiple flights a day. So this nectar that she's collected, she'll store in her special honey stomach and is bought, brought back to those house bees, those sort of middle-aged bees within the hive. The house bees will then pass the honey back and forth. It's a very dignified form of regurgitation between themselves. And during this process, they add important enzymes and they reduce the amount of water that's in the nectar. Once they deem it ready, so it's ripe, they have gotten enough water content out of the nectar, the final regurgitation into, um, doesn't go into another bee, it'll go into one of the hexagonal cells that one of the house bees have made. Then the house bees will come and they will fan their wings over the nectar to help get the remaining moisture content out. This um, evaporation causes the sugars to thicken within the nectar and for it to become that sort of sticky honey that we know of. Once it gets to that point, the house bees will come and cover it with a thin sheet of wax. So this white up at the top of the frame um, so you can see below, there's our unripened honey that the bees are working on. And then up at the top, that white is our wax capping um, that the house bees add on to it. And then the bees will consume it later when there is a dearth or a lack of blooming forage. Um, as beekeepers, we are always planning ahead to ensure that we leave plenty of uh, honey for our bees when we're doing our harvesting. And uh, the hives that we use, those standard box hives that you'll see is synonymous with beekeepers um, are built for the bees to add in more honey than they would need during a dearth. So we are always watching out for our ladies to make sure that they, they have what they need. So now we know how honey is made. I want to explain honey. I'd sort of explain it the way like a sommelier will, will explain wine. The weather, the year, the location and the types of flowers that they, they visit will all play a part in how the honey is gonna taste and look and smell, just like wine is dependent not only on the type of the grape that they're selecting, but the weather that year, the temperature and the location that they are grown. So I'm gonna talk just really about our seasonal bees um, because they're kind of cool. They travel around the county um, and they, during the year, will pick up six different nectar flows. So early January this year, we moved our bees up to NZ Tropical Fruit Company up on Tropical Trail in Merritt Island. And there, they're going to forage on the mango blooms out of this mango grove. When these blooms come in, you walk through the grove and it just smells the most beautiful floral, fruity, almost citrusy kind of a smell. So they're going to forage on these mango groves and they're going to make this honey that's in the back here. Um, and it is a very sweet, light, floral, fruity honey that will come out of the hives in mid-March. 
once they we pull the honey supers off and we remove the that mango honey out we'll move our hives down back to our home apiary in miko where they're going to get this sort of second half of the saw palmetto bloom um, and that is this honey so if you look between this honey sort of in the middle to the one on the end it's a much lighter so this honey is very light sweet lemony and that's because of the saw palmettos the elderberry and the fiddlewood that starts blooming towards the end of that so once that bloom is done we load them back up we take them down to crystal lakes in south melbourne beach where there's a dense area of mangroves and this honey where is this one this one's right up front here it is dark and thick and rich and it tastes like you're eating a piece of salted caramel. When we first tasted this honey, it was a new honey varietal for us this year. It was, I, I was like, oh my gosh, this tastes like the salted caramel from Southern Caramels that just blows my mind and I love it so much. And it feels like you're kind of tasting a piece of the Indian River without all the gross yuck, which is kind of nice. So after they are done in the mangroves, they head back to our apiary and they pick up a late summer wildflower bloom just from all the little local wildflowers that are around our apiary. Um, and it's another dark one, but it is very sweet and floral and light, even though the color is somewhat similar to our mangrove honey. After that, Hello. we get cabbage palm bloom. Um, and this I'm cabbage fine, thank you. Is I'm sitting watching uh, that uh, self garden uh do you want to mute your, mute no your no no that's okay i can she's very long in between each picture and a lot do you of want talking. to mute your mi microphone okay joyce are you able to mute everybody i just she must have just jumped on and i just okay oh. Oh, wait, oh. all right so after our summer we go to our um, cabbage palm blooms. And with this one, we are not able to harvest it because the water content in these cabbage palms is so high that when we cut the wax cappings off, it actually starts to ferment within the hive. So unless we were to sell sort of boozy honey, which oh, I, mean, I appreciate most people would like. <laughs> We, um, we actually give that honey, that honey goes to some breweries, uh, Intracoastal yeah. just made some yeah. honey yeah. or some beer with our honey. Um, that was awesome. So that just sort of gets used elsewhere. Then the last one that we do for the season for our seasonal bees is our fall honey, which is this one on the end. And that comes from the Brazilian peppers that we kind of love to hate because they're a non-native, they're an invasive species, but it is a bee's main forage for us in our area and for most of Florida. So all of the same colonies, they're just moved around a bit to catch different blooms. So a typical backyard colony, so like the one that just started in Melbourne Beach, I'm expecting to get about three honey flows a year from this hive. Um, and it's really, really neat because there's something for everybody's taste. I will say some honey is really gross, like so gross. I open it up and I'm like, mm, nope, can't do it. Um, canola honey tastes like boiled cabbage. Avocado honey is really dark and thick and it tastes like unsweetened molasses. But my husband, Leo, loves both of them. I am definitely more on the sweet, fruity side and he's on the bitter, savory, gross side. <laughs> so when people sort of expand their knowledge that it's not just that honey bear, there's so many more different flavors that you can pick from. Now that we know who our pollinators are um, and what our honey is, I did want to talk a little bit about how you as gardeners can sort of help support them. Our native bees and pollinators need those native plants to survive. The honeybee, honeybees will piggyback off of those plants as well, and they will thrive and produce more honey than what a typical season would give. The pollinators need those nectar sources year round. So when you are planting, pick a varietal of seasonal plants that will provide food even during a dearth. And it's not just the flowers. Think about what you're using as ground cover, even the trees and the shrubs. And I sent out, um, I had last year a planting guide with different 
plants for the different seasons. And I'm happy to send that out again, Joyce. Um, so that way you guys can have that as a sort of a little bit of guide. So you've got those bloom times throughout the year. A fresh water source is so important for the bees and the other natives. Um, that will help keep them from congregating in unwelcome places like somebody's swimming pool. If you just were to place a wooden board under a hose bib and turn the hose to drip about one to two drips in a minute, um, the bees will land on that and they'll drink that up. And our pesticides. And that's kind of something that is going to be around. The best way to deal with it is to use best practices when you're applying it, follow the label. And if you can, wait until the sun starts to go down as the pollinators are heading home. So that way it has a chance to absorb in and not be the first thing that the bees are and the native pollinators are grabbing onto when they get onto those flowers. Okay, bees in real life. Because as gardeners and people who go outside, you're going to come across bees in real life. So a little bit of information on what to do when you do inevitably meet up with some of these little lovely ladies in your garden. Part of the wonder of the bees is their ability to split apart and create new colonies each year. When their numbers get larger, the workers will decide we're a little bit overcrowded, time to split apart and make a new hive somewhere else. They'll actually put the queen on a diet they will shake her and bump her and push her around to get her into a more fit flying physique. And then they will actually shoo her out and about 40 to 70% of the hive will leave and go start a colony somewhere else. You'll usually see these swarms sort of hanging out on like a hanging tree and it's just like a clump of bees. That's kind of their stopping point and then they'll go on to find somewhere else um, to call home which can be in a water meter or a soffit or an owl box we just took out of somebody's backyard in Melbourne Beach, um, pretty much in all of the places where we don't want them to be. If you do come across one of these swarms or just bees in real life, a couple things to remember, resist the urge to swat at them. Stay alert for the, the buzzing around you, um, but if you do start to swat at them, they will, it'll send them into attack mode and they can send out pheromones to alert the other bees that come here, there's somebody here making us mad, we need help and backup. Um, and they'll more likely fight back. So when you get stung, the, the stinger has even more alert pheromones that will stay in you to alert the other bees, sting here, come on, get going. So your best defense is to run. So if you do get yourself in a situation where there's bees coming around you and you do get stung, remove yourself quickly from that situation. And if you're able to cover your nose and your mouth, preferably not both at the same time, because a bee sting in the nose or in the mouth would not go very well. Seek shelter, hide in doors, but leave them unlocked. Our bees lack opposable thumbs, so you won't worry about them trying to come in. Um, but if you do have a problem or reaction from the bees, you're gonna wanna be able to have help reach you. Um, and here is a really interesting piece of Jeopardy trivia. Oh, hold on, buddy, I'm talking to somebody. My youngest beekeeper has got something to tell me. Um, so our Jeopardy trivia, unless you are allergic and go into anaphylaxis where you can't breathe, a human can withstand, hey buddy, I'm talking to somebody, you're gonna need to wait. Can you go ask Kayla? Thank you. Um, a human can withstand five to 10 stings per pound of body weight. So if you weigh around 150 pounds, you would need to be stung around 1500 times for a mass envenomation, which could cause death due to the venom released by the bees. So unless you really mess with someone's equipment or lack the ability to remove yourself from a hive, you should be okay. Just do your best to get away from wherever those bees were. And if you do come across an unwanted swarm or an established colony, contact your local bee club with your location, photos if possible. Um, they will usually have a couple members that are willing to come out and remove those bees um, and give them a better home. Um, but if it is something that is within a building or a structure in the walls, be ready for a little bit of a cost associated with it because 
they'll have to cut and sort of do damage to get them out. They carry licenses and insurance and they have to sort of account for those costs. Okay, and a shameless plug for our business, you can visit our website, lkchoney.com for more information on what we as beekeepers do. And there is also a link to our online store. With COVID, we had to shift the way we were doing things and we now offer local deliveries and we do have two pickup days at our house in Melbourne Beach. Um, one really exciting thing that I think you guys would be interested in is our pollinator packs. Um, our eldest child was really interested in having a pollinator garden. So I called on our good friend, Nicole Perna, who's a local to Melbourne Beach as well. And we're good friends. She happens to also run Go Native Landscaping. And we sort of set up this little garden in our backyard and kind of said, you know, I think there's a need for this. People want to have support for the pollinators, but they're not quite sure how to do it. So we came up with this pack that includes, there's two different sizes. There's one that has mostly ground cover, smaller little plants. Um, we include the mulch, so you're ready to go. It just put it in the ground. We've got a little planting guide on where they'd go best. Um, and it sort of gives you everything that you need to have this pollinator garden. The next size up has some shrubs um, and a couple other extras in there. And then it includes some honey that you can enjoy while you're watching your pollinators work. Um, so those are in our online store um, by way of our website. So I hope that today you guys learned a little bit more about not only honeybees, but the magic that they make and also our lesser known pollinators that you as gardeners can support and what you can do to help these amazing creatures along. Thank you so much for having me um, and inviting me to be a part of your meeting today and listening to me ramble on about our bees. And believe me when I say I could sit here all day and chat bees, I could, but now I'm gonna turn it over um, if anybody has a couple quick questions because I know you have some other things to talk about. Well, thank you, Kristen, so much. That was awesome. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah, anybody who has any questions, if you can unmute yourselves. I don't know if I can do a group unmute, so. Just try to um, find the button on your device to unmute yourself if you have questions. Well, this is Carol. I have a question about those killer uh, hornets out in uh, the West Coast. How are they doing eradicating them? Do you know? Um, honestly, I haven't been following it too much. The little bit that I have heard from UF, um, they do a great they have a honeybee research lab there and they do amazing work um, and they put out a podcast once every two weeks so that i listen to and in the beginning they were talking a little bit about it more and more because people were interested in it but now i think they've sort of gotten a foothold on it and there's not really a concern that they would survive very well down here um so it's not something that i've really been keeping up on mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i saw uh, on tv they had a drone it was throwing fire at one of their huge nests. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I just wondered how that worked. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to do some research in on that one. Okay. Anyone Thank else? you. So I really loved what you had to say about the best practices for uh, pesticide use um, is to do it late in the evening so that there's less likelihood that they're going to um, attached to that and, and carried back. So um, thank you. That's yeah, absolutely. That pop in. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> I know when I, I I had given this presentation to my brother and my sister and my sister was like, I had no idea about giving them water. I would never have thought. And here, if we were to set out a little dish like people do in other places and they put a couple little pebbles in the bottom of it, all I can think of is the mosquitoes are just going to come and have a field day in it. So just like a, a simple wooden board underneath a spigot, a, a water spigot, or even like your air conditioner outspout, um, uh -huh. that will collect and the bees are able to suck it up, which is awesome. Okay, Alfreda is raising her hand and I'm asking you to unmute your device, Alfreda. And I made I even made you a co-host just to see if we can get you so we can hear you again. Um, and Billy's raising her hand. So you have to unmute your devices. I don't know why, you know, I can mute people, but then to unmute, I have to ask you to unmute. So you have to do it on your end. Let's 
see everybody. Um, okay, there was somebody I guess it was Carol. My gallery button is gone. Sometimes if you swipe, if you're on a uh, an iPhone, if you swipe the whole screen, it'll give you more options if you don't see them. Alfreda, if you want to type your co your comment in, you could do that as well. Can you hear me now? Oh, there you go. Hi, Michelle. Sure, we can hear you. Um, um, you said that, uh, Christine, you said that the queen eats oil, all royal jelly. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what is all royal jelly? So royal jelly is a secretion that the nurse bees can make. Um, and it's fed to the larva. All bees get it when they're larva at day three of being um, a hatched out bee. They stop being fed the royal jelly as workers where the queen bee will continue to be fed this royal jelly. And it's, um, you, I, you can purchase it. Some people will force the bees to mass produce it essentially in these really unique uh, scenarios. Um, and you can buy it and it's supposedly very good for you to eat. Um, but it's just a different, you know, protein, sugar, carbohydrate makeup than what the other bees will eat. So after day three, the worker bees will start eating the honey. Um, they also make bee bread, which is a combination of pollen and um, what else goes into that? I think a little bit of the nectar will go into it. Um, and that's their diet going forward, where the queen stays on the royal jelly for the, her, the entirety of her life. So basically it's pollen nectar? Um, the royal jelly, I'm trying to think what the makeup of it is. It's, it's essentially when the bees are sharing the, the nectar back and forth to create the honey, I want to say it is something similar to that, but it's really a secretion that the worker bees are able to make. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you very much. Yeah. Alfreda, I think you're unmuted now if you, if you do have yeah, a question. Yeah, and, and my, my picture disappeared, but that's a neither here nor there. Um, <laughs> I, I did, I recently just did a little paper for the Master Gardener's newsletter, which is going out there. I did some research on nectar and I was just so fascinated to find out that flowers actually tune in. And this, these were studies done by Tel Aviv University. They can detect bees wings and they, can then produce nectar with between three seconds and 30 seconds for the bee. Wow. Um, it it oh. differentiates between different flowers. They know when it's, when it's uh, a non-pollinator coming, they detect between the bee's wings or a bird or something mm -hmm. else that just does not pollinate because you, we, as you know, we know that the bee goes and accidentally gathers the pollen while it's taking the nectar. So I just found this absolutely fascinating that they have now done enough studies to prove that the plants can actually listen and they are responding to the sound of bees wings. And okay. each, each plant is then different in producing the amount of nectar. And of course the amount, and it also um, will develop maybe sweeter nectar which the bee then remembers and will constantly keep going back to those particular plants. I just found that absolutely fascinating. Hmm. Interesting. Well, and two, once, so if they find the flowers that they really like, what the workers will do is they'll go back to the hive and they do this, it's called a waggle dance. So they right. go in onto one of the frames that the foragers are all kind of hanging out on and depositing their nectar to the other, the house bees they'll do this really unique dance. And when we pull a frame out and we, you can tell right away when they're doing it, 
they kind of shake a little bit, they go around in a half circle, they shake a little bit and go back around. And they're telling the other bees in there, hey, this is the directions that you need to be flying to go find the flower that I just did. Yeah. So they'll yeah. communicate with each other with this dance. And it's, it is very, very neat to see it in, in real time. So after the after the, doing the research on the fact that the, the flowers and they believe it's that they believe it's the flower the petals that are actually detecting the uh, the beat of the wing of the bees wings I firmly believe all the things that I've read that trees can talk so <laughs> I really do well they they do have some communication through their root systems we know that but I just found that that was absolutely fascinating and I think. It, it just goes to show uh, we live and learn every day, and I don't think we've scratched the surface yet on a lot of things. True. Thank you, Alfreda. Okay. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Okay, so um, just before we say goodbye, Kristen, so you, you mentioned a newsletter or a guide. Is there a way to sign up to receive that? Um, Joyce, if you want, I can email it to you, and then if you want to pass it out to your membership, we can do it that way. Okay, sure. Okay. That'd be great. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you once again. That was really, really good. We really absolutely. That. Absolutely. Well, you ladies and gardeners have a wonderful rest of your day. Happy gardening. And I hope everybody's green thumb just is enjoying this nice warm weather. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. So we will continue on with our business meeting. And I think I might stop the recording.